Okay, this is part two of our uh, lecture number five, Church Planting Movement and Vision. And uh, in the first part of this lecture, when we were looking at the Church Planting Movement and Vision, we were talking about the Father's Heart. Okay, so just a quick reminder here, just in case it's been a while since you looked at this. We looked at the Father's Heart, that is vision of God, is that all should hear the gospel and all should have an opportunity to come to faith in Jesus Christ. So we identify segments in our community because we're wanting to reach everyone, but we need to know who they are, what they believe, what their worldview is. And then our goal is not just to reach a few people and extract them from their community and put them in a traditional church. Our desire is to start an indigenous movement in each of these segments in our community and world. We're wanting fourth generation disciple makers and churches. And so how do we get God's heart as God's missionaries and ambassadors? We abide in Christ as people who are desperate for God, desperate for His kingdom to come, and full of faith that only the Holy Spirit can grant us. And we do this by desperate prayer, ongoing, abundant, repetitive, faithful prayer by us, by our team members, for one another, by outside partners who commit to pray for us, and as we reach the persons of peace, training them from day one how to be interceders for their own people groups. So then we began to look at the actual uh, four fields model. And so in the top left-hand corner, we've got the, the lost people and the saved people in every harvest field. And with the saved people, we do two things. We cast vision, New Testament principles for disciple-making, uh, for leadership development, for church planting, and for gospel movements. Uh, and, then, and so we train them in these things. We offer to train them in these principles. And after these two lectures, you'll be ready to train anyone, because I've also uploaded a teaching outline uh, that goes along with this uh, for your resource folder. And then with lost people, we build relationship bridges, and we're praying for Luke 10, persons of peace, people who will be interested in the gospel and desire to take a step further in discipleship and study his word. So that moves over into evangelism, and we do mouth-to-ear evangelism, a verbal witness for lost people, that they hear the gospel, they hear our personal testimonies, they hear about the truths of the scripture, they hear Bible stories and what it means and how it applies to their life. And as we search for persons of peace, we have a regular presence in their life. We love them, have compassion on them, and care for them. We, have, we ask God for power to fall upon them, dreams and visions of the truth, a, a supernatural understanding of the word. And then we also proclaim verbally, share the gospel with them regularly and call them, call them to a clear commitment that they need to turn from their sin and trust in Jesus for their salvation. This moves us then into reproducible discipleship. And what is discipleship? Well, we teach them the basics of Christianity, but from day one we teach them how to feed themselves, how to be abiders in Christ, how to be prayer warriors, how to be ambassadors to their context and their social network, their language group, their people group, their population segment, their cultural environment, as Ed Stetzer and David Putnam say in your textbook. And so what do we do? In groups of 15, we meet in homes or apartments or dorm rooms or wherever we, it might be in, in huts if we're planning unreached, if we're planning churches of groups of 15 and unreached people groups in Papua New Guinea or, uh, you know, in the, in the deserts of, you know, the Middle East. I mean, whatever, whatever it happens, this is a reproducible model of Acts 2, 42 to 47, where believers were breaking bread, fellowshipping with one another, worshipping, giving one to another as all had need, praying for one another, sharing the gospel regularly, seeing people coming to faith in Jesus because they, were, they had a presence in lost people's lives. They were praying for power and they were daily proclaiming the truth about the risen, resurrected Lord. And so again, looking at this actual Bible study, what's happening uh, in an hour and a half study in the home of 15 people? There's that pastoral care, there's worship, singing worship songs, there's accountability. Who did you share the gospel with this week? How did it go? And then vision casting, Math 28. Why are we here? Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm always with you, but you will receive spirit from on high when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so being reminded, why are we doing this? This is so essential. And then the second, third is taking 30 minutes for the new Bible study lesson 
chronological Bible storing through different Bible books and saying, okay, this story, as simple as it can get, uh, what is it, what's the spiritual lesson here? What is it teaching about the character of God? Uh, what, what do I need to obey here? God is trying to say something to me that is, that, is, uh, that is something I need to obey. How do I put this truth into practice in my life this week? And Who needs to know this? I am an ambassador, and ambassador functions to tell people about who Jesus is. Uh, and then we break into groups of two or three, and we practice telling the story, getting it into our ears, talking about it, gets it down into our hearts, but then so much more than that, we need to practice every week telling the story so that we are capable, trained, equipped, and empowered to share it that week. Then setting specific goals. Everyone in each Bible study saying, here's three to five people I need to share this with. And knowing that they'll come back the next week and they'll be held account accountable to doing that. And then laying hands on one another, going back to this idea of being desperate in prayer, that we lay hands on one another, we pray for faith, that we'll believe God wants to do this, that we pray for obedience, that we will actually openly, verbally share the gospel, and then we pray also for boldness because God alone through the empowering spirit gives us boldness. So this then leads us over into the actual reproducing church field because the goal is for these discovery Bible studies as we make new disciples of, new lost, pe of lost people that are becoming new believers, these ought to become functioning churches. And so let's look at the three um, characteristics of a church, okay? So the first uh, characteristic of a church uh, is that um, there, there are, uh, is a covenant that's developed. So these believers covenant together to do two things. New believers are baptized, and they commit uh, to these principles. They commit to prayer. They commit to abiding in Christ. They commit to sharing the gospel. They commit to weekly fellowship and accountability. Uh, they commit to receive ongoing training. So there's the first characteristic of a church is the covenant, baptism and commitment to one another. The second are the three characteristics of a functioning New Testament church. They're self-governing, they're self-sustaining, and they're self-reproducing. They're self-governing because they're under the authority of Jesus, not a denomination, not an association. They don't need to send out somebody to go get training in the United States or seminary training in order to pastor and develop this elder board and these deacons. There's nothing wrong with those things, but the New Testament church means everybody is a kingdom priest. Everyone has the authority to meet together, to covenant together, to commit, to serve one another, and to serve their community by propagating the gospel. So then self-sustaining. So groups of 15 can sustain themselves because they're meeting in homes. So they're, they're already supporting themselves and have the place to meet. That's one of the great things about planting house churches, apartment churches, dorm room churches, is that you'll never run out of space because everyone is living somewhere. If you go from day one to meeting in a location, then you have to keep that location going. You have to constantly raise money for rent and all these sorts of things. But if we plant house churches and apartment churches and dorm room churches, we'll never run out of room for the church to reproduce because you're, every time that a lost person is coming to faith in Jesus, you're starting a Bible study in their home and teaching them, them you're teaching them how to multiply uh, that Bible study along new disciples and leaders and, and churches and movements. And so this is so essential, self-sustaining, and then self-reproducing every disciple born with their missional DNA that they are called to go and make disciples of all nations. Every church being born pregnant, as Paul says, that every church is desiring from day one to reproduce. And so that's self-reproducing. And then the third characteristic is caring leaders, because every one of these Bible studies needs a caring leader who does the pastoral care, who makes sure that these studies are going in line with these principles, nothing's being left out. And then it really takes a compassionate leader who's able to reach into people's hearts, understand who they are, minister to them, because groups of 15 need leaders throughout the week that are calling them up and saying, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? How's your gospel witness going this week? And offering ongoing training, so caring leaders. So the three characteristics of every New Testament church is that they're self-governing, they are self-sustaining, uh, um, and that they're self-reproducing. And then the characteristics, of course, um, are that they develop a covenant through baptism and commitment. They, they are self-governing and self-sustaining and self-reproducing, but also that they develop and raise up caring leaders. And so at this point, we've got fully, full, um, fully developed and mature wheat tares over on the right, 
and they're now bushel, bu bunched together in bushels of mature wheat tares that, that, that uh, bind together to, to serve each other and, and their community. And so then there's three arrows. One is missing from this, but there's an arrow going back into the top left-hand corner. So churches then, in order to reproduce themselves, what do they do? They go back into the harvest fields and they begin to build relationship bridges with lost people, okay? So that's every church desiring to multiply itself and reproduce itself by evangelism with lost people resulting in new disciples who are being baptized, that are forming new churches, and that are multiplying back into the harvest field. Again, penetrating lostness. The second arrow is churches reproducing leaders in the center. And, the, and why do you think that reproducing leaders is in the center of these four fields? Because from day one, we're looking not just for persons of peace who will become disciples, but will become disciple makers. And so we are, from day one, looking for indigenous leaders who will propagate gospel movements, disciple and leadership multiplication within their own people group, language group. And so what do we do with leaders? First of all, we have to identify them. Second, we equip them. And third, we empower them. So when we're going into the harvest fields, Lord, raise up leaders for the harvest. So we are trying to identify, as we share the gospel, potential leaders. Then we equip them. From day one, we are teaching them, we're training them, we're making them into disciples who are also strategic thinkers who are being obedient to, to bearing fruit in their context. And then we're wanting to empower them. And you see down there the model assist watch letter uh, concept. And so from day one, we are modeling for them how to make disciples and multiply leaders and, and do the three-thirds home Bible study meeting. So we model it for them. From, from day one, we're wanting to give them responsibility. So we assist them. We let them lead. Then we're moving to watching them. We're wanting to work ourselves out of a job from day one because the goal is to multiply here, not to share responsibility, but to give responsibility and ownership of the Great Commission away to every believer. And so then we also, Paul didn't just leave, he wrote letters to the churches he planted. So always staying in touch, but moving on to plant new churches, make new disciples, raise up new leaders for the harvest. This is how multiplication, not addition, happens. And then there are three kinds of leaders that we identify. First, there are house church leaders. So every house church of 15, no more than 15, they need a leader to facilitate this ongoing process of multiplying disciples. We're also looking for regional leaders. So as new churches are planted within each segment, there are networks of house churches forming, and those leaders need a leader to keep them on track strategically. And so we're looking for regional leaders, but then we're also looking for the third type of leader, and that's an apostolic leader. And an apostolic leader does what the third arrow that's missing from this is. And there's supposed to be an arrow under reproducing churches that goes outside of this box. And this box represents a population segment, a cultural environment, or a people group. And so God, is, as he births new disciples, uh, new leaders, new churches, new movements within these people groups, he's also going to be raising up apostolic leaders to go back into unreached areas. So there's, we're looking for leaders that God, the Holy, that God, the Holy Spirit is raising up to go to other people groups, the unreached. Remember, we're looking at a world in which there are over 17,000 people groups Three to four thousand of those have zero access to the gospel. So God's heart is that none should perish. So if we have God's heart, we're looking to raise up apostolic leaders as well that will go to the unreached people groups all over the world and multiply these principles organically and indigenously. And so then at the very bottom, the last part of this is perseverance. And you see this, uh, this wheat tear that's dying. And the idea here is John 12, 24, unless, uh, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, uh, it will not reproduce. But if a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will produce a harvest 30, 60, 100 fold what it was before. And then, of course, Romans uh, 12, verses 1 and 2, therefore I let us offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to discern God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So that's church planting movement and vision. I believe 